My charge will be to discuss the burn hand contracture versus the Dupuytren's hand contracture and see if we could gain any insights into the mechanical treatment um, oversight looking at the burn hand uh, modalities as it relates to Dupuytren's and vice versa. I have no financial uh, interest to disclose. And the objectives really are, although obviously much different, the idea is just to generate some thought, some wonder, raise questions, and perhaps gain some insight. We'll start with this premise. This premise comes from two sources. One, my program director, Dr. Robsons, who's in the audience, had a unique gift of making us think. One day we would have our thoughts that I'm very confident that A is the right answer to this problem. And he would convince us that we were wrong and it was B. And the next day, B was wrong and A is right. And I actually know Charlie's story, uh, both before and after he went to Paris, and I, I believe I told him that he also was wrong. <laughs> so naturally, after realizing that I was wrong, uh, I went to Paris and I was fortunate to go with him. And uh, I think keeping an open mind is the key, both in this whole presentation. So can we learn anything between burn scar contractures and Dupuytren's contractures? Well, is it really comparing apples and oranges? Basically, when people say that, I think there are more similarities between <laughs> apples and oranges than um, non-similarities. So basically, this is food for thought. And as Dr. Osterman uh, briefly mentioned, uh, Dupuytren's, this is uh, the closest I could get. I didn't have his 1832 monograph, but uh, Dupuytren's really, in 1832, classified burns according to the depth and divided thermal injuries into different degrees of severity. So there is some relationship. And I'm still not sure, is it Dupuytren's or Dupuytron's? Do we have a consensus? Maybe at the end of this present, uh, end of this symposium. Yeah, call it clients. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. So if we go back, um, I won't belabor this slide, but it's basically looking at the Oxford definition of contracture. And Charlie uh, talked about one of the prior symposium, and the monograph there looked at Dr. Houston's questions, but. Um, he presented another one, and I think Dr. Malasi was also at that conference because your talk was within that monograph. And the questions really, that really uh, struck me was by Dr. Eislin, if I pronounced that correct. And he said that Dupuytren's really spreads into or invades tissue like a malignant tumor, not a benign tumor. And why does that happen? And how does it go beyond the Palmer aponeurosis? And why in only certain spots? And why is the natural history so unpredictable? So the really question to me is, does Dupuytren serve a purpose? I mean, does it serve a purpose to have your fingers contracted? I'll talk about that in one second, but I'm just adding two other, uh, Dr. Eisen also talked about the psychosocial aspects, and with Charlie's large series, and we talked about whether besides diabetes and other associated conditions, that psychosocial um, uh, diathesis should be part of that uh, continuum. And do these associations make a difference? We talked about maybe um, the treatment will be based on if you have five diatheses or other relationships or the genetics of it will make the treatment different. And how does that affect 
if you have Dupuytren's, really with diabetes, is the pattern different? And hopefully we can learn from the Lord's experience whether that makes a difference or not. Getting back to the question of does Dupuytren's contractures serve a, pers a purpose? Uh, Dr. Ryan in, in the hand clinics talked briefly in one of his articles about the palmaris longus extending into the palmar aponeurosis. That it's a strange phenomenon that it's not really a, it, it's a tendon but doesn't insert, insert into bone. And the only thing I could find out was that it was responsible for expose, exposing claws in lower vertebrates. Now, I haven't seen many in my practice lower vertebrates coming in with this problem, but <laughs> we uh, just food for thought. And this is the palmar aponeurosis um, extending from the palmaris longus into there. I just like the slide. It's a nice picture from our former mentor. And you can see the Palmaris long is merging into the palmar aponeurosis. So here's the typical Dupuytren's contracture. Not bad, but we've all seen uh, much worse ones, uh, but pretty typical. And the small finger PIP is really a difficult problem. And this, if you notice this slide, this contracture here in the thumb. And to me, that looks a little bit like this burn scar contracture. I'm still waiting for a burn scar contracture in someone with Dupuytren's, but uh, we'll see what that shows. Because that would be a, a really an interesting phenomenon, how to look into that in terms of their genetic makeup. I and mean, why do people scar so much? So, I could have fooled you to say that one is a burn scar contractor, one's a Dupuytren's contractor, but th these are burn scar contractors. And why did he in particular scar in that one particular area? And these are all questions. And why do people, and Dr. Robson in particular, former president of the American Burn Association, knows the severity of burns and children and certain other I guess you would call it a diathesis, scar so much, almost keloid-like, but not really. So this is a baby that burns. And uh, this is the exact opposite of Dupuytren's, where there was some controversy whether there's such a thing as a pediatric Dupuytren's patient. But we know that uh, babies, as they grow, form more contractures and scar excessively. And can we learn, can we take one field and, and bring it back and forth between Dupuytren's and Burns to uh, learn about it? I, I probably burn scar contractures predates, I think the first report was by Prometheus. And then you'll see that these burn scar contractures can become quite deforming, even more so than Dupuytren's. So what we can learn from Dupuytren's to extend it into the burn world would really be worth quite uh, worthwhile. So what what is important? You know, this whole symposium will be about how this happens and why it happens in prevention and restoration, and what causes burns to become hypertrophic, and hence, at, depending on the location, contractures. And why is Dupuytren's so variable? Now, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but hypertrophic scoring occurs virtually only in humans, which makes it difficult. There may be one animal model, but can the leap be made from these non-animals models or from lab work, from um, uh, cell cultures into the real treatment options. So we look at different uh, cellular aspects of fibrosis and use that as a guide, looking at um, collagen formation and, and different uh, cellular factors. 
we look at the modulators of SCAR collagen, both in Dupuytren's and other, besides burns, other uh, contracture or SCAR forming problems. We look at mechanical tension and how that differentiates fibroblasts into myofibroblasts and what can be done to alter that tension. Can we use the, the models that in one respect say that stretching it actually causes more problems, so let's not use splints, or yes, we can use splints, or can you take that cell culture and really make a, a definitive statement? Or does it depend on how often you stress it? Is it cyclic? Is it continuous? This was a little study and they looked at uh, human volunteers and found that the depth of the burn affects the regeneration versus repair. And that the superficial fibroblasts act differently than deep fibroblasts as the injury went deeper into the skin. So the response really to the insult is different. And this one, looking at mechanical strain, really was a cell culture of fibroblasts from female breast reduction tissue. So it's important to take away part of the results, but keep things in perspective. And there are different protocols that we use in the burn world that can be related to uh, Dupuytren's. And at this one, looking at CPMs and flexions and splinting and arthrodesis. So I'll briefly tell you about some of the uh, different treatments that were just mentioned. Uh, pressure garments, silicone splints and other recommendations for SCAR management in the burn patient and in SCAR management in general. So this is very straightforward. This, uh, for those of you who may not know, this is just a serial cast, a little plaster, and we use it in burns. We've tried it actually in some Dupuytrens, um, and after a week or so, you just remove it and stretch it out a little further. This is a similar uh, torture device whereby you slowly stretch it after you put your finger in it. This is a volunteer. And there are anecdotal reports of this Dynasplit working in Dupuytren's patients, but no, law, no significant controlled studies for such. Silicone gel has been used, and pressure has been used. I believe that Larson in uh, the 70s found out that the scar under a burn that had a splint seemed to have uh, increased the third phase. The mature wound seemed to be softer, and so they went to putting pressure on it with uh, silicone or these jopes garment that some have silicone inside to put slow, continuous pressure on the wounds to soften them. But in the long term, they almost end up the same, even though jopes garments are used uh, universally for burns. And there are different aspects. You could put inserts in to help reduce some of the hooding. And then there's uh, negative pressure ther therapy, the wound vac or Ingenix, which is actually not negative pressure, sub-atmospheric pressure to stimulate growth in certain wounds that would be counterproductive but can easily be uh, researched into looking at the subpopulation of cells and how they react differently to different pressure gradients within the skin. And this is just an example of uh, Integra, which is a bovine tendon collagen with uh, other <coughs> materials to act as a dermal substitute pre to prevent contraction. And there's, as you can see, there's a little silaster silicone sheath that comes on the outside that you remove in about three weeks and then you close over with a skin graft or a 
cellular substitute. I think Dr. Oled will talk about that. And does continuous passive motion have any effect? You know, with our burn scar contractures, we found that early CPM really makes a difference. And can that be incorporated into the treatment modalities for dupatrins? So there are a lot of things to do. And then can it be stretched out? I think Dr. Agee is going to talk about his experience. And I'll just talk, uh, show you one example of a uh, uh, device that we've used to slowly stretch up a severe burn contracture. And you can see the gears here. Uh, and it seems to work quite well. It's difficult to get end results because in a child, as they grow, it, they redevelop their contracture. But these are all modalities that could be used that hopefully can be, um, as mentioned, trans-referenced between burn scar contractures and dupagens contractures. So thank you for listening, thinking, wondering.